So a lot of times, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff about mental health, psychiatry, uh, you know, understanding that we kind of talk about that oftentimes uh, there's a lot of stuff about mental health and psychiatry that we don't cover very much on stream. So what I'd really like to do today is cover a couple of other topics. Um, so today we're going to talk a little bit. We have a great post from our subreddit about um, bondage, domination, and sadomasochism. And so we're going to take a quick look at that, and I'm going to explain some basics about how to understand like what is healthy and what is unhealthy, okay? So let's take a look. Is BDSM healthy? So I'm making this post because I'm struggling and I need some advice. I've seen a lot of conflicting evidence surrounding BDSM, kink, and mental health. I, I have a submissive kink, and I feel shame for engaging with it. I have this cycle where I can manage to move my mind away from the thoughts for a while until I feel like I can't take it anymore and I take action. I don't know if what I'm doing is inherently bad or just part of who I am. I've read that these kinks could be due to childhood trauma related to sex. I can say this does map onto my experience because I was molested as a child. I'm not sure what Dr. K or the community point of view is. Thanks. Context, I'm a heterosexual male. So this is a fantastic post, once again. Um, for a couple of reasons. The first is that this is like, it, it, I really like the way that this person is trying to figure out, okay, what is healthy? What is illness? What should I kind of do about it? Is this because I was traumatized? And I think these are all like really, really good, important questions to consider. Okay. So we're going to talk, we're going to do kind of a quick kind of run through of how I think about BDSM and what is like you know, healthy and what isn't healthy and stuff like that. Okay, so what's an illness? What's okay? So the first thing to understand is that <clears throat> the psychiatric attitudes towards different kinds of sexualities have changed a lot over time. Okay. And so, you know, like back in DSM-3, which was maybe in the 70s, homosexuality was considered an illness. Okay. And then... uh was a pathology. And then like in DSM-4, um, I think BDSM was considered an illness, was also considered pathological, okay? But the interesting thing is as we've sort of started to learn a little bit more about BDSM, and this is one of the areas where there's actually like very little research, um, so we don't have a lot of good, we have like very few clinical trials or I, I don't think I've ever seen a clinical trial on like treating people with BDSM. It's mostly things like case reports and like observational studies. So we, we don't really understand the science of it very much. But in DSM-5, for example, they sort of, I think they have an acknowledgement <coughs> that, you know, BDSM in mild forms is okay. So let's try to understand, like, how do we think about the classification of, like, mental illness with BDSM? So the first thing that, so we're going to kind of explore a couple of terms, okay? So one is going to be, like, a paraphilia or fetishism, okay? The second is going to be, um, so how do we define this? So fetishism is the use of a non-living object. or um, non-genital body part for sexual gratification, okay? So it's sort of like, you know, like shoes or feet, like these are things that are not generally considered like sexual organs. And so like when people are sexually aroused or use these objects for sexual gratification, then that's what we call a fetish, okay? So this is what's what's kind of interesting. So there was a, 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 done, a study done in Quebec that sampled about a thousand people, okay? And what percentage of them do y'all think had fetish fetishistic thoughts? What do y'all think? Yeah, so it's 50 to 60 percent. Wild chat, okay? So this is, I, I think I, I think this was not self-identified uh, people who had a fetish or paraphilia, 
but 50 to 60% of people were sexually aroused by a non-living object or non-genital part of the body. Okay. So about eight to 10% were like intensely aroused by a particular thing. So this is when we're probably getting into true kind of more fetishism where like people were like super into feet or whatever. And by the way, a quick question. Do y'all know? Oh, sorry. Sorry. This is, this is wrong. I got these statistics wrong. This is actually 45%. And so here's the next question of people who have a fetish. Oh no, it doesn't, it's not displaying. I'm lagging. So of people who have <coughs> a fetish, do you guys know what percentage of them are into feet or sexually aroused by feet? I know the iPad's not updating it. Well, it's just lagging. It's actually 50 to 60% of foot fetish. <laughs> Isn't that wild? Okay, so we'll see if I can get this back in, but... Um, om nom nom desktop. Okay, so in the meantime... Okay, here we go. All right, we're back. Okay? So, so 8 to 10% ha are, are intensely attracted to something, okay? And then... Um, 25%, actually 26%, tried it once, and about 3.5% do it regularly, okay? So like fetishes are actually like remarkably common, um, and so like this is not considered really an illness, okay? So then there are a couple of other things. So let's talk about, you know... Um, yeah, so 50 to 60%, this is the Quebec study. So once again, we don't know if this is like, this is all people or just maybe people in Quebec are super into feet. We don't know, okay? So now, like, if we think about, you know, how do we define an illness? An illness is really defined as something that impairs function. Okay? So this is where, when we kind of think about it, there's like, a, a, there's, there's a, you know, fetishistic disorder, so what happens here is like their fetish is so powerful that, um, and we'll get to this a little bit later, their fetish is like so dominating that, for example, when they have problems or when they have sex with a partner, their partner will feel like they actually are not having sex with like a, a partner. They'll feel like the, the, you know, the person with the fetish is just like using them as like an object. It's kind of hard to describe. But, you know, with patients that I've worked with, um, and we'll get to this in, in a second, but you know, with patients that I've worked with, like what the partner will describe is like, they don't feel like, you know, they feel like if I'm, if I'm the partner and my partner has a fetish, what I'll, dis what, what I'll hear people say is that, oh, you know, the, the person with the fetish isn't having sex with me. They're just like using my feet. Like they'll use language like that. So at that point, for example, it's creating a problem within the relationship. And so therefore it can be qualified as a disorder, right? Because then it's impairing function. Other examples of fetishistic disorder is, you know, people are engaging in the behavior in a way that, like, is non-consensual or, like, you know, impacts other people. So, for example, um, you know, like, rubbing genitalia against, like, people in public places, I think, is called frauderism. And so that's another example of a disorder because, you know, that's something that is, like, sexual assault. And if you, like, engage in that or you have thoughts that you really want to do that kind of thing then it's really going to get you in trouble and so therefore we sort of classify it as a disorder okay so next thing um is so then there's also sexual sadism disorder so sexual sadism disorder is when someone is kind of defined as the recurrent and intense arousal to inflict physical or physiological suffering on another person so this is like where the intent is to create suffering. And this is going to be really important. Okay? So it's kind of interesting. So if you look at statistics, the overwhelming number of people who get diagnosed with sexual sadism disorder are men. So it's uh, male predominant. And, um, you know, there are some associations with trauma, and we'll kind of get to that a, a little bit more. But like, so trauma is kind of tricky. Let's just talk about it now. So like, what's the relationship between, you know, sexual fetishes and trauma? The short answer is like, we're not sure. So it does appear that people who are traumatized um, I think, 
you know, there is a link between trauma and some amount of like sexual stuff, but I don't think the, I haven't reviewed the evidence very well. I don't think the evidence is, is really that compelling yet. I think there are a lot of questions that we need to ask. The research is just poorly done. So for example, you know, I, I haven't seen any studies that look at healthy members of the BDSM community and ask them how many of you were like sexually abused. I have also haven't seen studies with people who are, who are vic victims of like sexual abuse and ask them, you know, do you are, are like, do you have fetishes? Right. So like, I'm sure y'all can understand, hopefully you can understand that those are like, like, really difficult questions or arguably even like inappropriate questions to ask a patient with trauma, right? Like if someone comes in and says, yeah, I was sexually molested at the age of eight and as a provider, like it's, it's, it's very difficult to ask a question like, oh, you know, what do you get sexually aroused by? Like that's, it's a very, like, it's a hard question to ask. And there's even evidence, for example, that, um, like, there are a lot of clinical considerations that come into play when treating like BD people who engage in BDSM. Some of them really demonstrate like, so some of this paper talks about a lot of concerns that, you know, practitioners will judge people who are into BDSM. Practitioners will think that BDS BDSM is a consequence of sexual trauma, which in turn is like incredibly val invalidating, right? So if like, if someone comes in and has a sexual preference, like let's think about homosexuality for a second. And if I, as a provider say, oh, if you're gay because you were, you know, assaulted, like that can be like very, very like invalidating to the person. So there are a lot of like challenges in a clinical setting and in a research setting for us to really get good answers on this. But at the same time, I still think we can learn a lot today. Okay. So the sh uh, people who are traumatized, we don't, the short answer is like, I don't know. So I tend to treat people with disorders and trauma. Like I don't really tie the two together. I may assess them with trauma just because I, uh, for trauma, because I assess all my patients for trauma, but I try to like treat them as kind of like their own unique thing. And I don't draw correlations with trauma. There may be evidence out there. I'm not an expert on trauma and sexual fetishes. So, so be it. Okay. So these are the two disorders that I sort of think about when it comes to BDSM. So then we get to actual BDSM. Right. So, and this is where like, for example, the, the ICD 10, which is the international classification of diseases actually classifies BDSM is still as a disorder. We're up to ICD 11 now. And so I think it's changed a little bit, but I think generally speaking, this will classify it as a disorder, but it's kind of changing. So here's the key thing. So if you're, if you're interested in BDSM and you're trying to figure out, you know, do I have an illness? Do I not have an illness? Here's the key thing. So in people who engage in healthy BDSM relationships, they kind of inflict pain as a source of pleasure. I know it sounds kind of weird. Okay. So when I, when I have an, someone in my office and they're, they're asking me literally like, am I ill? Like what I'll, what I'll, what I'll ask them is like, what's the goal of the BDSM relationship? Like, so, because usually what happens in healthy BDSM relationships is you've got a, a you know, a, a, a dominator and you've got a submissive person and they both kind of agree to that, right? Because like the submissive person gets sexual gratification out of being submissive and the dominator gets sexual gratification out of being dominating. And so you kind of pair up and the goal of the behaviors is to pleasure both parties, Right? So like, I'm going to dominate you, you're going to be the submissive, or you're going to be dominating me, I'm going to be the submissive. And the goal of that, like the reason that we're engaging in this is so that both of us can have fun. So when I really think about BDSM, and, and we'll get to some statistics here. So it seems like, um, you know, so the way I'd kind of describe it is like, they seek to provide pleasure along with the pain or humiliation, or the pain or humiliation is actually an avenue to like pleasure and satisfaction. Okay, so that's what I kind of think of in terms of healthy BDSM. And with se sexual sadism disorder, the goal isn't to pleasure the person in the end, it's to actually like hurt the other person. So the goal here ultimately for BDSM or healthy BDSM, I'd say is pleasure. And the goal for the disorder is to actually to create suffering, like you're trying to hurt someone. Okay, and so let's go through a little bit of um, kind of statistics about the BDSM as, as a non-clinical entity. So the interesting thing is that men tend to have urges for BDSM starting at less than 15 years old on average. Women, on the other hand, 
sort of recognize their BDSM urges, um, usually post puberty. So once they're fully sexually mature, like women will start to have like more BDSM thoughts. Okay. Um, the average person who sort of recognizes that they're into BDSM and sort of fully sort of gets it actually happens in their mid twenties. So what we kind of see is that like real insight happens like in their mid twenties. So like what you'll see is, I guess, statistically, you know, you'll have like a 14 year old kid who sort of gets aroused, like maybe watches pornography. That's like a little bit rough. And then for a woman, what you'll tend to see is that, you know, they'll start to have like more thoughts like that after they're, they're done with puberty. And then like, by the time you're mid twenties, like you kind of know whether you're into BDSM or not. And so then kind of, so that's kind of how I think about BDSM. So I think that, um, I want to say that one to 2% of the population is into BDSM based on some natural surveys. It may be as high as 3%. We're not really sure, but it seems like it's a normal sexual variant is kind of how I classify it, unless it is crossing into the realm of impairing function or really has the intent to like create suffering. And people may be kind of confused by this and they may say like, what does it mean to inflict pain as a source of pleasure? So the best analogy I actually have here, so if we think about negative experiences, right? So if we think about pain or fear, so let's like think about fear as an analogy. Generally speaking, fear is not desired, right? You don't want to be afraid. But every year at Halloween, a group of people pay money to get scared and find the experience pleasurable. And that's what we call a haunted house, right? So haunted houses are good examples of like willingly engaging in what appears to be like a negative experience for the sake of pleasure. And it's lots of fun. So I'm, I, you know, hopefully I'm not offending anyone who's into BDSM or anything like that. But I think that we have to remember that like for some people who don't understand this, it can be really confusing that pain would be a source of pleasure or shame would be a source of pleasure, right? If you're a submissive person and you want to be humiliated, like how can someone have fun being humiliated? Like what that, what's that about? And so I'd ask the question, how can someone have fun being afraid? And when I'm talking to people who don't understand that, I find that the haunted house analogy actually works really well because it explains to people, oh yeah, like I, you know, I can understand how like being afraid is actually like can be fun. So in the case of BDSM, what we tend to see is that there's shame, humiliation, pain, domination, even like, you know, controlling people. So these are like emotions or experiences that generally speaking are classified as negative. But when you engage in a consensual, healthy relationship that's like secure with another person, they can actually be like <coughs> pleasurable and completely okay, right? And so haunted houses are an analogy of that. There are other examples I'm sure you can think of, you know, where like, you know, in relationships, like you and your partner may like try to scare each other, right? And that's like kind of fun, kind of not fun, you know, whatever. Um, so now let's talk a little bit about, you know, like kind of clinical presentation and like as a psychiatrist, like what do I see? So the first thing is, you know, if you guys are concerned about where you are on the spectrum, I would say by all means, go see a licensed mental health professional and have them help you sort it out because that's what we're here for, right? We're here to help you sort out, is this a problem? Is this not a problem? So I'd say that people tend to present <laughs> to my office in a, a couple of ways. One is that they, unfortunately, they get into trouble. <laughs> I unfortunately have seen my fair share of this, where people are coming in because either a court is mandating it or, you know, like they did something at school that they weren't supposed to do or like, you know, like they, they were just doing something that they really weren't supposed to do. So they get into trouble. And either some authority figure or some institution or someone close in their life basically like forces them to come. The second reason that people uh, present, and, and so by the way, if it gets you into trouble, it's more likely to be classified as a disorder because it is causing you real life consequences. Second reason that people come in is partner is uncomfortable. And so like I mentioned earlier, so like a lot of this is like comes from the partner where the partner's like, you have this kink. They'll judge the person with the kink and they'll say, you need to go get mental health help because you are a sicko, right? So the partner's uncomfortable with particular things. Um, sometimes it'll be judgmental. Sometimes it won't be judgmental. Sometimes it'll be an actual problem, right? So this is, this is a case where 
the patient has more interest in the fetish than the partner. So what that sort of means is like the partner of the patient sort of feels like objectified and it's they don't feel like, you know, they're having sex with a partner. They feel like they're being like used in some way. And then the third, I actually have never seen a case of this now that I think about it. The third reason is that, you know, a patient could self-present with concerns. I've just never, you know, I've, um, no one, I've never had someone with BDSM self-present. I've had people self-present with concerns about, you know, sexual orientation. I've had people self-present with concerns about, um, you know, sex addiction or porn addiction or things like that. But then the third, you know, option is that someone shows up, which maybe some of y'all will do now if you're, you're concerned. You'll go seek mental health help and then you'll try to figure out, you know, what's what's good and what isn't. When it comes to sort of trying to figure out, so once someone shows up in my office, there's a series of kind of questions that I'll I'll ask, right? So I'll ask, like, when did it start? You know, is there any kind of trauma involved? You know, like, like, you know, how much, how intense is it? Right. So these are like questions that, you know, will sort of help me understand. Okay. So if you've got a foot fetish, like, are you able to engage in sexual activity without feet and you can still, or, and you're just kind of turned on by feet? Or is it something that, like, unless there are feet involved, you can't really engage in sex at all? So we'll sort of ask questions like, you know, the intensity of it. Um, you know, d is it disruptive in some way, either in terms of your relationships or things like that? D or do you have trouble concentrating? So, like, concentration, relationships, you know, there are all kinds of ways that it can be disruptive. So has it negatively impacted your relationships are you, do you have trouble like going about your day because you are obsessing about this? I have seen actually cases of OCD masquerading as sexual fetishes before. That's really interesting. So it's not really a sexual fetish, fetish but it's a, an obsessive, intrusive, unwanted thought, which is actually OCD. It's not a sexual fetish at all. They're not actually aroused by it. They just keep thinking about it. And then a lot of times with, you know, with the clinical presentation, we see a lot of stuff like shame, right? So like, like the, the person who posted, they feel ashamed for having these kinds of thoughts. And so in terms of how to work with these people, you know, I, I think a big part of it is like asking some of these questions and sort of determining, okay, does it negatively impact your life in some way? Yes or no. Next thing to kind of think about is, is this something that you can engage with, with a partner for the sake of mutual pleasure? And once you find a partner and you guys kind of talk things out and you sort of figure out, okay, what are our safe words and stuff like that? If you're in a healthy, secure relationship where you can experiment with someone and, you know, the purpose of engaging in th these behaviors is for sexual gratification of both of the parties involved, then I, I would call that just a healthy, normal variant of sexual relations. It's kind of interesting because just as I was preparing for this, I looked at the Wikipedia page for BDSM and it was really interesting to see like, you know, cave art from like the fifth century BCE of like, you know, bondage and domination and things like that. Right. So like historically humans have been into this stuff for like thousands of years. And so in terms of <coughs> going back to this actual person, you know, this is what I'd recommend is that, you know, I have a submissive kink and I feel shame for engaging with it. So this, I think, is something that you should work on changing. So having a submissive kink is one thing, but remember that the goal here is not for you to feel ashamed about yourself for having the kink. It is for you to engage in the shame for the purpose of, like, enjoyment, right? So if you feel ashamed about a particular sexual practice, then I would encourage you to go see a therapist. This is something that I'm not sure that our coaches you know, they haven't gotten any training in this kind of stuff. So I'd see an actual therapist for this. And so the, what, what I'm kind of he seeing here is that I have this cycle where, you know, I can manage to move my mind away from the thoughts, but then, you know, they get control of me. So like, this doesn't sound healthy to me, right? Where you're pushing something out of your mind and then it, it forces itself back in. For the, the people who, who I've worked with who are in healthy BDSM relationships, it's, it's like a part of their day or their week that they enjoy to engage in. You know, they're kind of like looking forward to it at the end of the week. Um, even people with a submissive kink who are into being humiliated, like, 
you know, before and after they feel good about it, right? So they're like really looking forward to it and they'll engage with their partner and they'll, you know, like, you know, go down to the, the dungeon that they have in their basement. They'll do some like really solid BDSM and then they'll like, you know, go to bed and the next morning it's like pancakes with strawberries and chocolate chips, right? So it's like part of a, a lifestyle that's like sort of like is healthy, right? So I'd say if, if, you know, feeling shame is part of your kink and part of the way that you engage in pleasure. There seems to be, you know, the current prevailing thinking in my personal opinion is that that is probably a variant of normal sexual activity. If you're feeling shame about the way that you feel or, you know, what sexually gratifies you is not pleasuring another person through kind of shame and humiliation but if your actual intent is to like hurt someone and you mean them like malice right like if you're malicious and you really want to like hurt someone then i really you know get more concerned about a disorder once again you know this is a, definitely a situation where like the goal of this is not to diagnose or treat anything you know i haven't listed out diagnose for people who are curious what does diagnosing this actually look like you know, for each of these things that I'm sort of sharing, each of these has diagnostic criteria, right? So there's like a set of questions that you have to check certain boxes, and then you will meet diagnostic criteria or you wouldn't meet diagnostic criteria. How people answer all of these questions, and I ask many, many more, will ultimately be how you form a diagnosis. So the goal of this stream is not to diagnose anyone, and what I mean by that is like, Nothing you learned on this stream is sufficient for you to diagnose yourself because the process of diagnosis is actually like a more complicated, in-depth and thorough process where you do have to talk about, okay, what's the role of trauma? Is this sexual sadism disorder or is this the result of some kinds of emotions that have come out of trauma? So that's like a good example of like a good diagnostic process that you need to work through with a clinician. The real goal is just to explain to people, okay, so like, is BDSM healthy? Like, what's up with that? What, what is healthy? What is unhealthy? What is What do those buckets kind of look like? And if that seems kind of interesting to you or important to you, I'd really recommend you that you go see a licensed mental health professional. Questions? Um, yeah, so I, I, you know, for people kind of saying interesting stream. So, yeah, so there's actually, uh, there, there, I saw a study. I have, I thought I had a reference. Let me see if it's, um, so maybe this one. I'm not sure if this is the study, but I think this one. In the background of this paper that I just linked, I think they actually do point out that there's evidence that uh, couples who engage in BDSM are happier than couples who don't. Not saying that everyone should engage in BDSM, but, and I forget exactly what the population was. That may be like couples that engage in BDSM where one partner wants to are happier than, than in, in other situations. So that's something where you definitely want to look at the population Right. So remember, anytime you're looking at a scientific study, the result is not the only important thing. The population that you're studying is the only, is like just as important. Right. So there are all kinds of results. And this is the problem with like media. Media will just share the results. They won't tell you what population you're looking at. So if I were to make the statement, you know, couples that engage in BDSM are healthier than couples who don't. But the population matters. Are we talking about all people? Or are we talking about people who are interested in it? So people who, because a lot of these studies, what they'll do is they'll ask people who self-identify is having a fetish, and then they'll sample them. So if, if you take couples who self-identify as having a fetish, then you look at which ones engage in behavior and which ones don't. What you find is that people who engage in behavior are happier than people who don't. But you're talking about everyone who wants to, right? So that's an that's a, a important distinction. And at this point, I'm just rusty on you know, which pot, because like these studies are like, there's no uniformity. So it's like really hard to remember which study was looking at what population. Um, are people, are more people into the fantasy of BDSM than engaging in it? Fifty Shades of Grey. So like we said, right? So I think the Quebec study was sampling everyone. And that's what's so interesting about that study is that 44% of people voiced a desire. So I think it makes sense why Fifty Shades of Grey like took off so much, right? Because 
there's like nearly half of the population is like interested in kinks in some way. And then the person was asking, are more people interested in engaging in it? And then like, like I said, so 44% of people seem interested in some kind of fetish. 26% of people have tried it once and like 3% engage in it regularly. So it sort of makes sense, right? So like 50 Shades of Grey was like, there's a, there's 44% of people are like sort of into it. Um, <clears throat> uh, yeah. So then the other thing that I really didn't get into with this co conversation is, you know, there are a lot of like theories of psychotherapy, like Freud, for example, thought that, you know, all kinds of sexual desires were like, you know, manifest in weird ways or weird childhood experiences early in childhood would manifest as particular sexual desires. You know, sexuality and like Oedipal complexes and like erotic drives and all that kind of stuff, you know, that's very well represented in, in psychodynamic theory. Um, it's not something I'm an expert in and it's not something that I've seen great data about. So like, I think you can have all the theories you want. It's, you know, the question is like, what about the data? Um, and, and so from a clinical perspective, I think those can be really useful. So I, I sometimes think that, uh, you know, a big part of Freud's emphasis on sexuality had more to do with Freud than it did with psychotherapy or psychoanalysis. Isn't Freud regarded as 99% wrong? I don't think that that's a fair way to regard Freud. I think what's happened, so Freud actually gets a bad rap. So here's what happened with Freud. The stuff that Freud was was right about has become such a common part of thinking that we don't even credit it for him. So anytime that you use the word subconscious or you think about the subconscious as a concept, that's something that Freud should probably get credit for in terms of popularizing that idea. So what happened with Freud is like his major contributions and the reason that people like respect him so much is because he's the first guy that really laid out the idea that we have a mind that has a conscious component and like a not conscious component. And that some of the things that you do consciously are driven by things that you're not aware of. That central concept, which has been revolutionary for the field of psychology, like you think about, you know, everything that we talk about, you think about like, you know, so much stuff about subconscious. Why do we tilt? Oh, it's because subconsciously this, this, this. Like Freud gets some props for that, right? Because he's the one who really popularized that concept. And the other thing is that Freud was quite prolific. So I don't know, like percentage wise, I'd say that most of, probably most of what he wrote is like not widely regarded. But the thing is he, he really he really knocked one out of the park. Like he, he really like struck the jackpot once with a major concept that I think we've all sort of like internalized and accepted as a society.